Praise the Lord. Good morning, class. <laughs> Welcome to our Faith and Healing School. Glad you're with us this morning. Uh, this is the, uh, the class that we feed ourselves on God's Word, right? Their Bible tells us there are many voices, many things to read, many things to listen to uh, uh, in this world. But uh, this class, we listen to what the Spirit of God has for us, right? The exclusive exclusive word of God, and in, in doing so, our spirit grows, our faith gets stronger, and we learn how to overcome. So that's what this class is about. Those who are joining us uh, for the first time or maybe have been with us uh, previously, uh, we say welcome. I'm Eddie Storino. I'm pastor here at Abundant Grace Church, and uh, we just make sure, have your Bible, something to take some notes, and, uh, and prepare our hearts to receive from God. Amen. Uh, the word, his word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. And uh, um, does light help you? <laughs> Doesn't light help you, right? Uh, have you ever been in a storm and the power went out and you had to fumble around because you weren't necessarily ready for it and uh, looking around for a light or a candle or something, right? Uh, darkness makes us stumble. We, we, we trip over things in the darkness. Now, why do we, we trip over things? Because we can't see, right? We can't see. They're there, but we can't see them, right? And the light, thank God for the light, the light exposes darkness, right? It makes things clear. And uh, so this class is about that. It's about hearing from God, uh, giving his word priority in our life. You know, and, and truly, God does not want us to fumble around, stumbling around in darkness, tripping and hurt. And he, here's something even more. If you trip over something in the dark, sometimes it's not a big deal. Sometimes it could be a real big deal, you know. Sometimes you can really hurt yourself. And uh, I think the worst is getting up in the middle of the night and kicking that little frame of the bed with your pinky toe. I don't think there's anything that hurts as bad as that, right? And... Uh, but if the light was on, it would be a completely different thing, wouldn't it? You'd see it. You'd see it. Clearly, you'd see it. And you'd take a different path, wouldn't you? That's why his word, and we're going to talk about this this morning, because I believe that's what the Spirit of God wants us to, uh, to, to talk about. But uh, we endeavor in this class to be led by the Spirit. Amen? And we talk about things that, are, that pertain to Spirit. God is a Spirit. We are a Spirit. And uh, those who worship him, worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, too many of the world and even in Christian circles are trying to uh, experience God through feelings. And, uh, they, and, and they'll come up and say, well, I, I just don't believe it because I don't feel anything. That God is a spirit. And uh, when we become more spirit conscious, and I don't mean uh, weird, you know, like we're floating around like, like uh, Sister Patty, woo, you know, not, not, not that kind of weirdness, not in a weird way, but just in tune, recognizing what we really are in that if we want to hear from God, we have to look inside, not, not for feelings and things on the outside. And, uh, but his word and hearing his word and studying his word and becoming students of his word causes us causes us to look inside, to, 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 to hear from God in the spirit realm. And that's why I said his word, his word, the most important thing that we can do as students of his word and as believers in general is meditate in his word every day. If you want to have a, if you want to know Jesus, you got to know his word. His word is, is him. It's his word. John we know this. John, the first chapter says uh, that, that uh, in the beginning, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and it dwelt among us. Who are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus being the Word. So if you want to get to know the Word, if you want to avoid, uh, if you want to get to know Jesus, you got to get to know him in his word, in his word. The most important thing, God bless you. The most important thing that we can do is meditate, spend time in his word. And you know what? The entrance of his word, or we could say the entrance of Jesus, if you will, into our life 
gives light. It gives us light. It causes us to know some things. It causes us to see clearly. It causes us to, uh, to avoid obstacles that we can hurt ourselves on, doesn't it? Where walking in darkness, you know, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 that the path of the just believers, those who are children of God, who have accepted him into their heart, uh, their path is like the noonday sun. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. But those who are in darkness, it gets darker and darker, and they start tripping over things, and it's so dark, they don't know what they're stumbling over. But it's not so for the believer. And you know what else is interesting is God's, Jesus is the word, and Jesus is also the light. The Bible that as well, right? The light of the world. And so light gives life, right? Light gives life. We need, we need uh, light to sustain life. Jesus is that life. And so when we know him and we know his word and we spend time with him, we see clearly, we hear clearly, and he's able to direct us. And that's, you know, I mean, that was a, a quite a long introduction, but that is the premise of this class, whether it's healing you need in your body, whether it's wisdom that you need, whether, whether, you know, maybe there's a decision that you're facing and you need to hear from God about it so that you make the right decision. You know, uh, it's found in his word. If it's, if it's, if it's an overhaul in your finances, it's found in his word. He'll lead you. He'll show you. And, and, you know, I had the spirit of God say this to me today. It's real simple. Obey what I say. Obey what I say. You know, but we have to be clear to hear. We have to be able to hear what he say, what he's saying to obey it, right? But if we'll obey what he says, we'll walk in the provision that he promised for us. And you know, this class is a, is is setting time aside in your day to uh, an hour or so to hear from the spirit of God. And you know what? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they're not disappointed, right? Their hope will not fail them. They're, in other words, their confident expectation will bring the desired result. God said that. Amen? So, uh, so let's pray this morning. Uh, make sure you have something to take some notes with. And let's expect to hear from God. Do you expect to hear from him today? I do. I expect to have utterance. You know, it, it's not about me and what and how much knowledge and what I know about the word. It has nothing to do with me. I am simply a, a steward, a manager, a messenger of his word. And I, and I take that very, very, very seriously in, in a real spirit of humility that the Lord has called me to herald this truth in this manner. But it's, it's not about me. It's about what he wants to say to the sheep, to his sheep. Amen? So he's the good shepherd. We are his sheep. And he wants to lead us, feed us, lead us, and, and direct our paths. Amen? So uh, let's pray, and let's expect to hear from the master today, uh, for he knows exactly what we need to hear. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come to you now. Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we, we, we esteem your word as the most important, the highest priority in our life because we know your word is also you. And the entrance of you into our lives through a living fellowship gives us light. And light gives us life. And light gives us direction. And light spares us from tripping over things and injuring ourselves and taking detours and ending up in the wrong place. So, Father, we look to you today. We thank you that the entrance of your word is giving us light today. And we say, Holy Spirit, you teach us. You've been sent to us by the Father expressly to quicken to us, to lead us, to guide us, to strengthen us, and to teach us. So we recognize you today. We acknowledge you as that, and we expect you to do that for us. Father, give us revelation knowledge. Give us impartations of truth. Cause the words to jump off the page and become like lightning bolts shot up into our bones. That's what we expect today, real revelation truth truth that we can behold and walk in. And Father, we say that you be glorified. You be magnified. You are the only one 
that deserves glory, honor, and praise. And everything that we have and anything that we've ever amounted to is because of your goodness and grace upon our lives. So you bring glory to yourself today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to God. Well, let's uh, get our scriptures out. Uh, That's what we do here in this class also. The Bible is our textbook. So uh, uh, if you don't, uh, you can grab one. If you don't have one, you can grab one as well. Uh, you can take that with you. And uh, we read, uh, We read. it's more of a confession. It's a prayer that Paul prayed. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time or maybe even here in the classroom for the first time, uh, we do this not as a, a ritualistic type of a thing, right? Because um, ritualistic things, there's no faith mixed with it. We're doing it as, you know, because either it eases our conscience or we feel better about ourselves. But we do this as a matter of uh, obedience to God. And we do it in faith, and every time we do, I'm thankful to the Lord Jesus that we are receiving revelation knowledge beyond things that we've known before. And it's, and it's because we esteem his word. So we read the, uh, the, the Ephesian prayers that Paul prayed, and then we also read the one found in Colossians. So you can follow along with me. Uh, I'm reading, this is God's word translation, and I've kind of... Uh, turned it into the first person as if we are praying it. So, uh, so we can read this and pray this together and expect, expect to receive revelation, amen, uh, to walk in the fullness of what these prayers are. So Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17, Paul is praying here. He says, I pray to you, the glorious Father, the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation as I come to know you better. Then I will have deeper insight. I will know the confidence that you want me to have and the glorious wealth that your people will inherit. I will also know the unlimited greatness of your power as it works with might and strength for me, a believer. You worked with that same power in Christ when you brought him back to life and gave him the honored position, the one next to you, the Father, on the heavenly throne. Jesus is far above all rulers, authorities, powers, lords, and I like to say governments because we understand that, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but also in the world to come. You have put everything under the control of him concerning the church. You made him the head of everything for the good of the church. The church is his body and completes him as he fills everything in every way, in every way. Glory to God. You know, uh, one thing that just jumped out at me as we were praying this prayer in the, in the very top here, he, Paul's praying that he would receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation as he comes to know. And then he said he'll have deeper insight, deeper insight. That's what we're gaining. Isn't insight important? Isn't that wisdom? Isn't knowing what to do and not feeling like you're at a loss and I have no idea what's going on? As believers, when we, when we come to this, this knowledge and this understanding and this living relationship that we're ha- to have in a communion with the Father, uh, we should never say, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> because here's the truth. You may not know what to do, and that's true, but we don't need to say that because the one that we serve knows exactly what to do. And if we'll just get quiet and trust him and listen to him, you, what do you think he's not going to show you? If your kids came to you, desperate and say, Dad, wh- wh- what do I do? And I just said, uh, hmm, I bet you wish you knew, didn't you? And then I walk away from them. What kind of father would I be, right? And, and what kind of respect and love would they even have for me? They wouldn't. And God's the same way. If we'll acknowledge him in all of our ways, he said that he'll make our path straight. But we have to trust him. And that's the, and that's the other side of it. If, if my d- daughters came to me and said, Dad, what do I do? And then I tell them, and they're like, oh, really? Nah, I, I think I should do this. Normally, I would say to them, why did you ask me? That's what I would normally say to them. And they're like, well, and I'm like, don't you think? Do you honestly think for one second that I'm telling you something that's going to make it worse for you? I'm quite a bit older than you, and I have experienced some things already. And I know that this will be better for you. It may not seem like it right now, but in the long run, it's going to be better for you. And then you get them to a place of trusting and believing, 
Uh, just like we're two with God. It's the same. It's a living relationship. But I have found that God is not being tried. And we've said this before. Our faith is being tried. We, when he tells us something, we shouldn't argue with him and say, yeah, but I, I've, you know, so-and-so told me if I do that. Could you imagine saying that to God? So-and-so told me. And God would say, the so-and-so I created told you that? Well, I'm the source. How about listen to me? How about listen to me? You're getting secondhand information. I'll give you firsthand information. You know, and our response should be to him, yes, sir. I don't understand it, but I trust you. And I know that as I continue to step out and do this, you're going to show me more. You're going to show me more. And when I get to the place where I feel like I don't know, I look to you and I say, God, what's the next move? <laughs> what's the next step? What's it? Isn't that what happened with Moses and the children of Israel when they had the ocean in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them? God didn't say, he didn't give them the whole, well, if you do this, and then once you get over here, there's going to be some problems, but I'm going to give you manna, and I'm going to give, he didn't tell them any of that. It was step of faith, step of faith. You know, they probably thought, now what do we do? And Moses got quiet before the Lord, and he said, you know, and, and he cried out, and, and God said to him, why are you crying out to me? You know, I already told you that you were going to deliver my people. So do you think I brought you to the sea so you can drown now or get slaughtered? In other words, God must have been saying, where's your faith? Did you hear me or didn't you hear me? You know, and what did he say? God is so good, he's merciful. He said, stretch out your rod and send the people across. Yeah, but there's water. <laughs> yeah, but. What do you think the yeah, but would have got them? Slaughtered. It would have. They would have died there. But they didn't, thank God. So, in other words, what am I trying to say? When God speaks, whether, we, whether it makes sense, whether we understand it fully, our response should be, okay, well, this is what we're doing. Moses must have thought, this is going to be a miracle right here. We're going to see a miracle, you know, but he trusted God. But if he got together and had a little meeting with his elders and said, now listen, this is what the Lord told me. But do you think, I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Maybe we should do this. And then we start reasoning. And then we start and we miss the picture. We miss God's answer. And what happens? We flounder miserably. We flounder in sickness. We flounder in lack. We flounder in depression. All sorts of things. When if we'll just say in the midst of not understanding, you be honest with him. God, I don't understand it. But I know you see something that I certainly don't. So I trust you. So he heard that on the inside because nobody else heard it, right? He heard it. That's where Moses heard that, right? Patty's been teaching on this here with us. Uh, a, a spiritual transaction. And, man, I don't know if I'm going to get through hardly any of this today but to get through the rest of our prayers. But I do want to talk about that. I want to talk about that, that, that hearing from God, you know, he heard from God on the inside, his spirit, spirit to spirit, right? You only hear from God when you listen to what he's telling you. If you keep shutting it down, shutting it down and yielding to reason, yielding to your friends, yielding to Google, yielding to, and it, then we, we cannot hear him clearly, clearly. You know, Brother Keith Moore has a series called Clear to Hear. And I'll tell you what, you can go to his website, all his materials on there. You can watch it all. It's all free. You can even send for it if you want it, you know, and it's all free. But uh, it's a great, great, great series. Clear to hear, you know. And so Moses heard in the Spirit. And it certainly did not make sense to just, what is a rod going to do to an ocean? In the natural realm, we'd say, What? What do you mean, stretch forth my rod? Can you see what's in front of me, and can you see what's behind me? The answer is yes, he can. He can see all that stuff. He knows it. He knows it. But he said, Moses, stretch forth your rod. And it wasn't some big audible voice that everybody heard it. Moses heard it, perceived it on the inside, and his spirit, stretch forth your rod and send the people across. So what did Moses have to do? He had to step out in faith and tell the people, get ready, because when I stretch forth my rod, I'm sending everyone across. Yeah, but Moses, what are you, blind? 
That's an ocean. Would send us across. None of us, we can't swim. And he didn't argue. He didn't, he didn't reason. He didn't try to figure it out. Because uh, when we do that, we get away from the answer. We get away from the answer because as we begin to yield to reason, we have an enemy that starts accommodating them reasons, false reasons. Yeah, absolutely. You, you're right. You are right. You got the, he'll tell you, you've got the wisdom of God here. You are right. You can't do that. I mean, there's millions of people. You're going to lose most of them. Why don't you try going, and it's a trap, it's a setup to get you to be defeated. That's it. And we'll recognize it as that. The minute we hear that, we won't reason. We'll just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. So we said all that because praying these prayers, Paul is saying, then I will have deeper insight. Deeper insight, wisdom, clear to hear. Amen. So uh, the next one that we're praying here is Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Paul continues praying, and then we'll continue to get into this as well. Man, there's so much in the Word. I think some of the, the more difficult things as a minister is, you know, you want to hear from God and minister what God has to say, but there's so many things. And as I begin talking about it even more and more, and I'm like, how can I cover all this? You know, but the good thing is we have tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. And so, so we'll, we'll hear what he wants us to hear. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so Ephesians chapter three, beginning in verse 16, Paul's continuing praying here. He says, I'm asking you, God, to give me a gift from the wealth of your glory. Wouldn't that be the greatest gift there is? From the wealth of his glory and power. Or from the wealth, you could say it that way, from the wealth of your power. Your power. He says, I pray that you would give me your inner strength and power through your spirit. That Christ will live in me through faith. I also pray that love may be the ground into which I sink my roots and on which I have my foundation. This way, with all of God's people, I will be able to understand how wide, long, high, and deep your love is. I will know Christ's love, which goes far beyond any knowledge. I am praying this so that I may be completely filled with you, Father God. Glory belongs to you, whose power is at work in me. By your power, you can do infinitely more than I can ask or imagine. Glory belongs to you in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time and eternity. Amen. Now, we spoke, and we're going to get into this, and I even mentioned it on Sunday, uh, getting into a series about, um, about love and understanding what love is. And since the Lord kind of revealed some truth to us concerning this, when I, when I read this now... You know, the, the Lord always confirms his word, and he confirms it, you know, out of two or three witnesses. Let every, so you find it in Scripture, and then the Lord confirms it again, and it bears witness with your spirit. And, you know, we have read, uh, and I've taught, I've taught on this in, uh, about the subject of love and how we need to walk in love because uh, our faith works by love. But the Holy Ghost uh, quickened to me another side of that, of that, uh, that, that teaching about love. And I see it here differently now when I'm praying this prayer than I used to see it. Paul, and thank God for the Holy Ghost, because I am not smart enough to come up with that on my own. I would never know it. I'd have just continued. But we get ourselves to a place where the Lord is, is wanting to reveal more truth to us, you know, and uh, more of his word to us. And the reason that he does that, because it's going to help us in our walk and, and get to next levels and do the greater things. But Paul's saying here that not only our faith works by love, but our faith works by understanding God's love for us. Okay? And we see that now even more clearly in Ephesians chapter 3. And the truth of the matter is if we don't understand how much God loves us, we're not going to believe him when he says, I want to heal you. We, right? Healing is goodness. We believe we're healed because we believe he loves us. If we didn't believe he loved us, why would we believe he'll heal us? Does everybody understand that? So our faith is, is it, we, we walk by faith understanding his love 
for us. Now, when you understand that love, that how much he loves us, you're going to, the Bible say that the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. You will walk in love towards others. And when we see that scripture, like in Mark chapter 11, you know, 23, 24, and then verse 25 says, and when you stand praying, forgive. In other words, we can't have aught against others. It does hinder our faith, right? Sin hinders your faith. And not walking in love and, and harboring bitterness and unforgiveness towards another brother or sister is sin. I mean, we don't want to call it that, but that in essence is what it is. And, um, and, and sin is a blocker. Sin blocks God's blessings in our life. You know, I heard, the, and I don't mean I heard an audible voice, but I heard it on the inside even this morning, this exact thing. Sin is to the things of the Spirit as oil is to water. Sin is to the Spirit realm, okay, uh, communi- communion with God, things of the Spirit. Sin is that to like oil is to water. Now, what do we know about oil and water? They do not mix. You could shake it up. You could put it in one of them things and you go to the paint store that shakes a five-gallon bucket. And you could shake it for six months. And it'll get real small bubbles all over. In a matter of minutes, the oil is going to be on the top and the water will be on the bottom. So what do you think the Holy Spirit was trying to show us? That sin and the things of the Spirit never could ever gel and mix together. And sin, God does not hate the sinner. He hates sin because it opposes him. Why do you think he hates sin? Because it's the very thing that separated us from him in the garden. And who was the author of that? Satan is the one who came and did it. And man yielded to it. So sin, God cannot tolerate sin because of what it did to his relationship with his children. Does everybody understand that? That's why God hates sin, not because he hates to see his children having fun. And we have put this misconception on if you're sin, you're having fun. And it may seem like fun for a little bit because when I lived in sin, it was fun for a little bit till the next day and then maybe the next week. And, and as my life spiraled out of control, I realized, man, this is not so fun anymore, right? Sin is to the things of the Spirit as oil is to water, which is why God has told us, Jesus said it, go and sin no more. Now, that's another subject. We're not, I know we're kind of all over the place here, but, and we're, we're going to cover some of those things as well. But, uh, but it, it, it's, it's walking, it's walking, uh, understanding God's love for us will cause us to release faith in what he promises us. You know, if we don't understand that he loves us, we're not going to believe him when he's, we're not going to look to his word and say, yeah, I know he don't like me, but he's going to heal me. You just wouldn't do that, right? We wouldn't do that. So, uh, so, so these are important things. Uh, the last one that we're going to read is Colossians chapter one, beginning in verse nine. You guys getting anything today so far? Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. You know, that's how God looks at sin. And, you know, sin is a blocker. It is. It's a separator. Can we live our lives sin-free? We can. Jesus did it. And, uh, and we can, too. It, let's, let's change our mindset on, oh, well, that's just impossible. Stop saying that. If it's impossible to you, then it'll be impossible to you. But if you have a desire... I wake up in the morning and I say, Lord, I want to please you with all my spirit, soul, and body today. I want to go through today without sinning. And I know that you want me to, so I'm asking for your help to do it. That doesn't mean you're not going to feel something and you're all of a sudden going to be tempted to get mad. And that, that happens. That's life. That's the flesh. And the flesh is at enmity. It's against God all the time. But when that happens, Jesus was tempted. So being tempted is clearly not a sin. Because it says that Jesus never sinned, right? But he does tell us he was tempted. So when you're tempted to do that, whether you're driving in the ro- on the road, someone cuts you off, or you get into an argument, stop it before it turns to sin. And guess what? You will have gone through the day 
without sinning. Being tempted to sin, being tempted to get mad. The feelings may come up, but you say, no, nope, no, nope. the love of God is shed abroad in mind. And the Holy Spirit will quicken you when you're about to cross that threshold. You'll hear that eh on the inside. And you can either go, the heck with the eh, I'm, I'm unloading right now. And again, that's our choice. All right. And flesh wants to unload, but the, the spirit wants to remain calm and walk in love. Walk in love, right? So it is possible. We need to start saying that. We can do this. We can walk through life. We can go day after day without missing it or sinning. Listening to what the Spirit of God is saying. He'll lead us, right? He'll lead us. So Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, Paul continues here. He says, For this reason, I have not stopped praying about this or seeking God concerning this. This is his priority, and let's see what it is. I'm asking you, God, to fill me. With the knowledge of your will or your word, his will is his word, through every kind of spiritual wisdom and insight. Now, this is coming from a man who's in prison right now, which you would think in the natural he'd be asking for a way out. Get me out of prison. Get me out of prison. But his priority was not to get out of prison. His priority was to know him, being filled with the knowledge of his will. I ask this, he says, this is why I'm asking you, Father, so that I can live the life, the kind of life that proves that I truly belong to you. Then, and only then, will I want to please you in all of my ways as I grow in producing every kind of good work by this knowledge about you. I'm asking you to strengthen me by your glorious might with all the power that I need to patiently endure and overcome everything with joy. I also thank you, Father, for you have made me able to share the light, which is what you want me to inherit. You, Father God, have rescued me from the power of darkness, and you brought me into the kingdom of your Son, whom you love. Glory be to God. We are no longer slaves to fear and sin. No longer. No longer. You know, another thing, I'm driving over here, and uh, and it just came up. I heard my, I was praying in the in the spirit. I was praying in, in the Holy Ghost and other tongues and didn't know what I was praying, obviously. But, you know, when you pray in the spirit, you, if you'll notice, if you do it, you, and the more you do it, you begin to start to pray stuff out in English. And you begin to say stuff in, in your known tongue that you normally wouldn't have said. And you may even say to yourself, where did that come from? Well, that's called praying in the spirit. Praying in the Spirit is not some, woo, speaking some spiritual. We do it, praying in tongues by faith, and the Lord gives us the utterance in our known tongue. And whether it's to help somebody else, 99% of the time, it's for your benefit. Because the Bible says, praying in the Spirit, building ourselves up on our most holy faith. And so I was praying in the, in the and so I wanted to say that to you because it's not as mysti mystical. There's nothing mystical about it. It's real. We're praying in our, in our, no, in our, in the, in the spirit language that we believe we've received by faith from the Holy Ghost. And we begin to pray in the spirit, uh, and, and we begin to pray things out that we would not known to pray for, or we begin to exhort ourselves or we begin to hear ourselves say things that we it's not coming out of our own head because we're not even thinking about it. It's coming from the Spirit, from the inside. And so uh, the, the Spirit of God, as I was doing that this morning, he's, uh, and, and the reason I was saying that, it just came to me now because I didn't even know why, it, why I thought it, it blessed me when in, in the car when I was driving here, but you, Father God, have rescued me from the power of darkness, and you brought me, translated me into the kingdom of your Son, whom you love. And as I was praying in the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, I heard myself saying, you've been adopted. That's what I said. I've never said that ever, ever. And, and it bears witness because here we've been translated. I am no longer, you know, when, 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 uh, when, a, when a, a child is adopted or, or somebody's adopted, they become part of the family that has legally adopted them. So in other words, all the good and all the bad now belongs to the person who's been adopted. Thank God in our relationship with God, there's nothing bad. It's all good. His riches, his power, his glory, everything about it is now belongs to us. So 
when, when we read the scripture that, Father God, you have rescued me from the power of darkness and you brought me. You adopted me into your family. You've put your spirit on the inside of me. And now I am part, part of your family, part of your family. When you, you're, you're, everything that you have now, I could go to you and say, Dad, I need this. And you're going to say, you can have it because you're my son and I'm your father. It's yours. We've been adopted, adopted into the family, rescued from the darkness of this world, from death and destruction that, 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 that is devouring the world. We have been adopted and, and pulled from that and brought in to the family of God by believing that Jesus is the Son of God, died on the cross, and rose from the dead. That's the adoption process. We, 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 uh, and, and the Bible even says we cry out, Abba, Father, right? And, uh, and, and now we are, we are part of his family forever, forever. And all his goodness and all of his blessings belong to us. So when the enemy tries to tell you anything contrary to that, you tell him that, I am no longer yours. I'm no longer. You abandoned me, and you tried to deceive me. I wouldn't go back to you for all the money in the world. In fact, I've been adopted now into the richest family in the world. The richest family in the world. And everything that I need, he has for me. And you tell him that, and he goes away like a little coward that he is. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. So that's good news. And you want to know something? That's not just for us sitting in this room. He wants all his children to be brought back in and be adopted back into the family of God, which we once were, which is how we were supposed to be until sin entered the world uh, through disobedience and rebellion, right? But God has uh, sent Jesus to restore that relationship and make it possible, make it possible by paying because God is just sin had to be paid for. Because there was a legal contract that was broken. Man broke the contract. So man had to pay for it, but it had to be a sinless sacrifice. And that's what Jesus is. And that's what he did for us. And that's the greatest news ever. And of all times that we should be sharing that and giving gifts to people, that's the gift that we should give because that's a gift that never runs out. Amen? And that's good news. So anyway, the last, uh, whatever, 10, 15 minutes that we have here, if you have your Bible, uh, I want you to open up to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And uh, in, in a couple sessions past, we've been talking about, and I kind of alluded to it here this morning, um, about uh, uh, faith working by love. And the other side of the dice, if you will, and I don't want to call it dice, the other side of the, of the coin, uh, I don't even know if that's any better, but anyway, the other side of the subject, I should say, um, is the fact that faith working by love is faith working by an understanding of God's love for us. Does everybody understand when I say that, what I mean by that? I want us to understand that our faith cannot work and what do I mean by faith working? Our faith cannot believe God for something if we don't first know that he loves us. Does, does, doesn't that make sense? And you ask yourself that. Can you believe that somebody wants to do something good for you if, they, if you think they can't stand you? Isn't that quite, yeah, you, you think, hey, no, I can't ask. I mean, maybe we've even done this before, you know, we, 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 we think of someone and we, we need something, and then we say to ourselves, no, I can't ask them. I haven't talked to them in, in God knows how long. You know, they would think I'm a this and that. I can't just call them. And, and, be, and why is that? Because we don't know how they feel about us. So how could we have confidence that they'll do what we need? So it's important for us to understand that our faith to believe or our faith to receive from God is based on our understanding of how much he loves us. Now, that seems so elementary to us because we're sitting in this room right now, and I believe we have a great understanding of how much God loves us. That's why we're here. But believe it or not, there's a vast majority, and I'm talking about the church. 
believers. The world certainly has a, a, a misconception of who God is, but there's a vast majority of the church that doesn't understand that God is love. And you know that because you hear them say, well, you know, if God wants to heal you, he will. If he doesn't, well, then that's just his will. And, and, and it's so unscriptural. It's so nowhere near the scriptures. You know, that would be like me saying, I have the ability to do something for my children to help them, but uh, I just don't feel like doing it. But I love them, but it's just not, I, I just don't feel like doing it. It's ridiculous. Most people would say to you, what's something wrong with you, right? That's what I want to say to people when they say, well, God, you know, chose to heal so-and-so, but um, the other guy he wanted in heaven. It's, it's unscriptural. It, it sounds religious, and it sounds like someone knows a few things, but the truth is they don't know anything because if they knew that God loves them, they'd believe that he wants them well. But people don't believe that God wants them well because they don't understand his love for them. That is why that is why they don't believe. So it isn't more faith. It isn't more let's keep jamming more faith scriptures and healing scriptures down people's throat. No, because how much faith does it take? How much scriptures does it take? One word from God. One word, quick into your spirit, faith the size of a mustard seed will get the job done. It'll get the job done. But if we don't believe that he loves us, then our faith to believe him tells us right here in Galatians uh, chapter 5 and verse 6 that our faith works through love, through love, through God's, un through an understanding of God's love for us. Now, uh, I started speaking about this, and for the next couple of minutes, we'll, we'll go over this. And I already uh, began to talk about this, how sin is to the Spirit as oil is to water. And I want us to see that, that visual, because uh, I wish I had oil and water I, I, just so we could see it visually. But oil and water, don't we all know that. It doesn't mix. Oil will stay on the top. You could shake it up and down. You can do anything you want with it, and they will always separate. They cannot exist together in harmony mixed together. Neither can sin, okay? Neither can sin mix with the things of the Spirit. Does everybody understand what I mean? Why, why am I saying that so emphatically? Because there's too much. There's too much of this co-mingling, coexisting with sin uh, because we reason, and that's just the flesh, uh, and trying to attain the things of the Spirit at the same time. And this should be a, 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 a big answer to the question why some things are not happening the way they should be. And, and, and it comes down to, you know, from now on I want you to picture the oil and the water. <laughs> they cannot mix together cannot mix together so is there a remedy for this yes there is yes there is number one jesus is our example and you know i always say jesus is my hero because he lived his life as a human being the son of god gave up his his royalty to come as a servant and live as a man on the earth tempted with feelings and emotions in every uh, 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 five physical senses that we have, he had. And yet the Bible said that he lived his 33 years on this earth without sinning. Without sinning. How did he do it? How did he do it? People will tell you, well, he did it because he was the son of God. Like the family feud, big X. Wrong answer. He didn't do it because he was the son of God. He did it. And if we'll look right here at Galatians 5, 16, he did it because he walked in the Spirit. He walked in the Spirit. So can we walk in the Spirit in such a way? Now, that sounds somewhat uh, not ambiguous, but a little like, well, what do you mean by walk in the Spirit? 
Let me say this to make it real simple for you. You could say, I say then, verse 16, listen to the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walking, the term walking means companionship, okay? It means following. It means giving priority to. It means listening, listening. Now, we see in Jesus in his life, and why, now let me ask you this, why is this important, especially in this class and especially to a believer? Why would this be important for us to, to look at in our own life uh, and, and possibly find some wisdom and answer to why maybe there's been some blocking going on? This is important for us because God is not trying to withhold any good thing from us. Okay, he's not trying to withhold it from us. If we're not walking in it, it's I would, I would say this that we're trying to mix oil and water, and oil and water cannot mix, cannot mix. Now, this is scripture. This is just as much scripture as Himself bore my sickness and carried my disease is scripture, or it's just as much God's anointed word as I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? And it would do us really well and good if we would spend time meditating on this. So Galatians five sixteen says this, and now we, we've predicated a lot of this on this other subject of faith working by an understanding of how much He loves us, right? When you know that God loves you, the scriptures say we love him because he first loved us. And we read in Romans chapter 5 that uh, even while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So there's this love that he has for us. Now, it is his love for us that causes us to repent and change our ways, right? Not him wanting to punish us, but his love for us, his love for us. And so this, when we understand that, we'll not want to do things that are displeasing to him. And that, uh, you know, I use this example all the time. When I first met my wife, and she obviously wasn't my wife yet, but when we were dating, you know, I, I, I had just, I wasn't, you know, walking with the Lord, certainly nowhere close to what I am now. I wasn't surrendered and committed to him. You know, I had walked away from God and just living to please my flesh. And, uh, and I was at the end of my ropes with all that kind of living, you know. And so I kind of was just sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know. And I, and I found myself playing the drums in a, in a Christian band, you know, after I'd been playing the drums in the bars all over the place. But I found myself playing in a Christian band. And so we were doing some, and I wasn't even, at the time, like I wasn't, a church going guy at the time. I, I, in fact, my heart convicted me so much. Even I thought I would say to myself, "Man, what am I doing playing with these guys?" They, they, and the and the Lord would quicken on the inside of me. I love you, and I know you love me. You know, just get your flesh out of the way. And, and so, anyway, I'm saying all that because uh, I came to an understanding and and that realization, and I repented and began to follow God with all my heart. But so now, in the meantime, I, I, I meet Melissa, and she is uh, on fire for God. And that really got my attention. I'm like, man. So, uh, you know, I'm thinking to myself, man, what a loser I am. Here I am raised in this thing, and I'm like acting like the devil himself. And, and now I meet this girl, and she loves God. Well, why did I ever even? And so I, I just was so over that whole thing. I'm like, man, she... And so her love for God really inspired me. It was a huge, and that, there was a, and I'm not going to get into this, but there was a prophecy years before that over my life that I'd meet someone and they would be a catalyst. And at the time, I wasn't remembering any of that. But then years later, after we got married, we looked at it and I was like, wow, that whole thing came to pass exactly the way the guy said it. It's amazing. It's amazing. But so anyway, I, I brought that whole thing up simply because uh, when I, first started meeting her, when I first started dating her and stuff, I wasn't, uh, I, I, I wasn't <laughs> like the sharpened, the sharpest tool in the shed, I should say, you know, spiritually speaking. And uh, I was still doing some things that, you know, that my heart would bother me about. And, you know, but I was just ignoring that and living to please the flesh. And, uh, and so, but when I understood how much 
that she loved me. I'm talking about my wife now. And her love for me caused me to want to stop doing them things because I knew she didn't like them. Now, she never said, she didn't give me the ultimate, you stop doing that or I'm out of here. Because in the very beginning, if she would have said that, I would have said, okay, adios. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, but she never did that. She just kept loving God and loving me, and we, everything was good. But I began to change because of her love for me. And I realized that, man, she loves me so much. I ought to at least have the decency and respect. I mean, I loved her. I wasn't rude or anything to her. But th- that means some of the things that I know she doesn't like, I should stop doing. And I have to tell you, now why am I saying that? Because it's God's goodness in our life. Not a preacher standing up here telling you you can do this, but you can't do that. You can do this, but you can't do that. We are no judge, not one of us. The only person we can judge is ourselves. That's it. If you want to be a judge, be a judge of yourself. That's it. So, But God's goodness, and when you begin to experience his love, like I began to experience Melissa's love, it caused me to change my ways. And so it's the goodness of God that makes a person change their ways, change their ways, little at a time, little at a time, and we become more and more Christ-like, right? So, uh, so, that, so I was saying that because it's God's goodness, not his looking to rain on our parade. It's his goodness. Healing is goodness. Be, having surplus is goodness. It's God's abounding goodness towards us that makes us repent and want to follow him. And so this, but now sin blocks God's goodness from operating in our lives. Now, we don't see it that way. We don't want to believe that that's true because it puts the the, the priority and the burden on us. God is not going to change because we refuse to change. Does everyone understand what I mean? He's not going to change what he established, and he's not going to say, okay, okay, I get it. They're stubborn. I can tolerate some sin. He'll never do that. So the change comes with us. It comes with us. And so, and we're going to end right with this, and we'll pick up here tomorrow. Galatians 5.16 says, I say then, walk by the Spirit, or listen to the Spirit, or live and follow according to the Spirit. Now, what do I mean by the Spirit? That inward witness on the inside, that knowing when you read His Word, when it's chiseling at you that you know you need to do something. That's what I'm talking about, walking and living and listening to the Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit. Now, people say this all the time. I just wish I didn't have my flesh to contend with. So, well, listen, until you're in heaven, you're going to have your flesh to contend with. That's just the way it goes. That's like saying, I wish I can eat anything I want and never have any calories in my food. It doesn't work that way, Right? If we have a problem and we don't want to sin and we know it's God's will for us not to, and he said that we certainly can live life without sinning, everyone that he ministered to, he always said, go and sin no more. A worse thing will come upon you. He's even said that. He told the woman who caught in adultery, your sins are forgiven, sister. Go and sin no more. And so he it means that we can. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said that to her. He would have said something like, listen, your sins are forgiven. Go and give it your best shot every day. Be the best you that you can be. That's not what he said. He said, go and sin no more. Sin no more means don't sin. Stop sinning, right? So now we have this scripture. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. Did you hear that? So we can listen to the Spirit, and not carry out the desires of our flesh, our carnal nature. And the more we'll read and meditate on the Word, the more Christ-like we'll become, the more the mind of Christ we will have. And when a temptation comes, we'll recognize it right away. The Holy Ghost will he'll arrest us, and we'll hear that, eh, there's something wrong here, something wrong. This don't mix with my new spirit. This is sin. I can't do this. And guess what? 
we won't do it. We won't do it. And you could go day in and day out, week after week, month after month, year after year. And the person who lives that way will do the greater works. We'll do the greater work. We'll be sensitive. We'll be clear to hear. We'll, we'll be able to hear, like Moses heard, stretch out your rod and send the people forth and watch a miracle happen right before your eyes. That's how we get there. It's possible. Say, I can do it. I can do it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. His grace is sufficient and his mercies are new every morning. Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, your word is so good. It strengthens us. It quickens us. gives us joy, peace, and hope. Lord, our desire is to follow hard after you like, like David said, that he follows hard, hard after you. Every way, everything that you say, we will obey, Father. We thank you for the Holy Ghost that will strengthen us, quicken us, lead us, and guide us, and enable us to lay hold of every one of these promises and overcome every obstacle and always do it your way. And we declare, we start uh, reprogramming our mind and renewing our mind, saying that we can live every day without yielding to sin because we will walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Father, we say you be glorified. We thank you for your word today that it's working mightily in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming out today. Those who watched us online, be a doer of the word. Let's not just hear it and get excited. Let's do it because it's more excited, exciting when you see results. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.